Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone and welcome to this next lecture on this course which is development process and social movements in India. Today's lecture is designed on the process of judiciary in India, its structure and working since independence. We all know that the judiciary in India has its very long history in the time of colonial powers and how this idea of judiciary has evolved over a period of time in modern times. But we also need to keep in mind that the idea of judiciary or the legal system in India is not only modern but has its long roots in the our past of ancient and medieval times. Many of the court structures, the vocabulary which we use in the local judiciaries or in the district courts, we find that they are highly derived from our medieval times. Similarly, the basic conception of justice and the human aspects of it, those are shaped by the ancient times and thus we can say that judiciary in India has a very, very long route. While understanding the working and functioning of judiciary in India and its structure, it is very important in the same vein to understand that judiciary in India derives its structure and power from the constitution of India and thus there is a direct link between the two. We all know that in 1947 when India got its independence, it was a very challenging time for it and it was at that point of time that India through its constituent assembly and the debates in the constituent assembly discussed at length the provisions in the constitution to ensure that there is some kind of check and balance between the different domains of power. Not only this check of, of check and balance, but also the separation of power which is the necessary ingredient of any democratic setup in the world was also debated and discussed. And it was through these two understandings that is separation of power and check and balance that India devised the process of parliamentary form of democracy where in the parliament the executive and legislative both are coterminous. On the other hand, this executive and legislative as they are coterminous in the parliament, there is the third organ and the most important organ in any democratic setup that is judiciary which is separated and that is how the separation of power takes place in the sense that it ensures some kind of check and balance in the democratic setup. If you look into the uh, very idea of parliament, the judiciary, the executive apparatus such as bureaucracy and the police and the formal structures of union state relations as well as the electoral system, they all are the set of institutions which are constituted by the idea of constitutionalism. Now here it is important to understand that the very basic framework of our constitution is inherent in what we call as constitutionalism that is the belief and faith in the understanding that constitution is the highest authority or the uh, uh, as the ultimate authority of law in this country and it is only through the provisions of the constitution that the basic structures of Indian political system is devised. And through this constitution only the parliamentary system of government, the executive, the bureaucracy, the political, the uh, police authority, all of these uh, derive their legitimacy. In the similar vein, the judiciary also derives its legitimacy and authority and power through the constitutions. 
Thus, all the organs of the state and all the legitimacy of these institutions of the states are inherent in the constitutional framework and that is how constitutionalism becomes very important when it comes to understanding the role and functioning of judiciary in India. Their arrangements, dependencies and interdependencies are directly shaped by the meta politico legal document that is constitutions and thus you cannot understand the whole working and functioning of judiciary without first locating the judiciary in the Indian constitution. We also know that the legal system derives its authority from the constitution and is deeply embedded in the political system of our country. The presence of judiciary substantiates the theory of separation of power wherein the other two organs that is legislature and executive stand relatively apart from it. And thus we can say as in the last seven decades or so that it is the executive and legislative which are generally on the one side of the fence while on the other side of the fence is the whole working and functioning of judiciary which provides the perfect separation of power and check and balance in the working of the Indian state. If you look into the working of the parliamentary democracy, we know that it works on the principle of fusion of power. Now here, when we say that the parliamentary democracy in India works on the principle of fusion of power, it precisely means that both the executive and legislative bodies are fused together in the Indian parliamentary system. Thus you see that while the parliament represents people's voice and their choice in the form of the elected MPs, it is those elected MPs who have the dual role. On the one hand, those elected MPs out of majority choose their elected head as the prime minister of country who is the executive head of this uh, country. On the other hand, the same set of MPs have the dual role of legislation and that is to take part, active part in legislating laws and thus both legislation and executive are fused together in the Indian parliamentary system. And in the making of law, there is a direct participation of legislature and the executive. On the other hand, it is the judiciary that remains independent and is strong safeguarding the interest of the citizens by not allowing the other organs to go beyond constitutions. And here you see that while on the one hand the e executive and legislative are fused together, on the other hand the judiciary is completely outside the domain of the parliament. And here the judiciary has the ultimate power to keep the check on the executive as well as the legislative so that they can safeguard the interest of the citizens and thus not allowing the other organs to go beyond the constitutions. In other words, they play the role of umpire or they play the role of safeguard of the constitution in India. It acts as a check on the arbitrariness and unconstitutionality of the legislature and executive. Now this is again a very important aspect of working of the Indian constitution that the kind of delegate balance it ensures between the executive, legislative and the judiciary that it is re remarkable to understand that how the judiciary not only check the arbitrariness of the executive and the legislature, but it also ensures that none of these organs enter into the unconstitutional acts. As the final arbiter in interpreting the constitutional arrangements, then again we find that the judiciary has a very important role to play and that is that it ensures that in the working or functioning of the executive and legislative that if there is any tension or tussle, then the court or the judiciary plays the important role of final arbiter and it also plays the important role of interpreter of the constitutional arrangements. It precisely means that in case there is any confusion or doubts in terms of understanding any of the provisions of the constitutions including 
the three lists through which the federal powers are divided between the center and the state uh, assemblies or state governments, then too the judiciary has a very significant role to play the role of the interpreter of the provisions of the constitutions. It is in fact the guardian and conscience keeper of the normative values that are authoritatively allocated by the state. Thus, in conclusion when we can see that if you look into the whole working and functioning of the judiciary in India, it has the very important status or role of a guardian or of a conscience keeper of the normative values that are authoritatively allocated by the state. Now, when we say that the normative values or the conscience keeper of the state is or the guardian is the Supreme Court or the judiciary in India, it precisely means that first we have to understand that what are those normative values for which the Supreme Court or the judiciary is supposed to play the role of the conscience keeper or the guardian. Those normative values are very much enshrined in the preamble of the Indian constitution. So, when we say that we the people of India, it is precisely the collective will of the people which is embedded in the sovereign authority of the state. Now, that collective authority of the people or their shared understanding of their aspirations which is vested in the sovereign body of the state, then that state is supposed to follow certain principles and those principles are again laid down in the preamble when it states that the liberty, equality, justice or fraternity needs to be safeguarded. Now, who is going to safeguard those liberty, equality, justice or fraternity? Then here comes the role of the judiciary in terms of playing the role of the guardian and of maintaining the normative values of any political society through its interventions. If we look into the judiciary in India and its origin and its long history, we find that it has its deep roots in the India's freedom struggle and its colonial encounter. Indian judiciary as a single integrated system of courts for the union as well as states which administers both the union and the state laws. Now, here it is important to underline at the outset that if you look into the structure of Indian judiciary, it is a single integrated whole and thus when we say Indian judiciary, we are actually referring to both the Supreme Court of India as well as the different high courts, provinces or different states and they all are integrated together, administer both the union and the state laws. At the head of the entire system stands the Supreme Court of India. Thus, if you look into the, again the structure, the right at the top is the Supreme Court and under which all the high courts are supposed to function. But here it is important to understand that the powers and authority of the high courts are directly derived from the constitution and Supreme Court is not the deciding factor as to high court will have what kind of powers. The development of the judicial system can be traced to growth of modern nation states and constitutionalism. As I have already stated that if you have to understand the working and functioning of the Supreme Court or the judiciary in India, you have to first understand the emergence of the history of the modern nation state in India through its colonial encounter and also through the whole provisions of the idea of constitutionalism as it emerged through the different acts 1833 onwards that how the whole idea of legislation, judiciary and executive was formulated during the colonial power and again during the constitution, constituent assembly debates that we will get to have a better formidable understanding of the working of judiciary in India. The as I stated that the roots of the judiciary in India goes back to ancient times. The whole system of Panchayat Raj or Gram Sabhas, the caste Panchayat as they were linked with the religion. So, Nyaya, the conception of Nyaya as it is used in Sanskrit, the conception of Dharm, they were co-terminus and here the meaning of the term Dharm was 
more wider in comparison to the modern day understanding of dharma as religion. And thus, the conception of nyaya and dharma were always used interchangeably and the conception of the panchayats always derived their authority through the, con the, the normative values which is attached to the conception of nyaya and the normative value which is attached to conception of dharma. Here again, when you go into the details of the idea of dharma and the conception of nyaya, then the idea of niti comes into picture and thus we find that the judiciary in the ancient time was largely driven by this conception of the niti shastra as well as the nyaya shastra which were the dominant paradigms through which the conception of justice was delivered. In the medieval times, the basis of legitimacy of the authority was that king can do no wrong. And here, the idea was very simple that the king is the representative of the will of the God. And thus, as a representative of the God, the king can not do anything wrong. And thus, its legitimacy was intact. And it is with the advent of the British colonial administrations that India witnessed a judicial system introduced on the basis of Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence. Now, it is for the very first time in the 17th, 18th century that when the British colonial settlers started moving to India, that they gradually established their dominance over India, first through East India Company and later through the British Empire. And in the process, they introduced for the first time what we call as Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence, which was based on the fundamental principle of what we call as rule of law. And here, this predominance of the idea of rule of law became the bedrock of the constitutional democracy in India in later decades and years. To start with, the Royal Charter of Charles II in the year 1661 gave the governor and council of and council the power to adjudicate both civil and criminal cases according to the laws of England. Now, if you look into the colonial encounter of India and its first experience or first taste of judiciary in India in the modern sense, then you find that the first reference point can be the 1661, the Royal Charter of Charles II Act. Here we find that this particular act gave the governor and council of the governor the power to adjudicate both the civil and the criminal cases according to the laws of England. And here for the first time, the Indian society and its understanding of Nyai or justice was completely delinked from its own past or its own experiences or its own text. It is it is for the first time through this act of 1661 that we find that the law of the England was executed here and on that basis the cases were decided. In addition, later on the regulating act of 1773 established for the first time the Supreme Court of India in Calcutta and thus you find that that became the watershed movement in terms of the emergence of institutions, judicial institutions in India went through the regulating act of 1773 that the Supreme Court of India was established in Calcutta. It consisted of Chief Justice and three judges, later reduced to two, appointed by the Crown acting as King's Court and not East India Company's Court. And thus, through this act of 1773, while on the uh, one hand, the Supreme Court of India was uh, established. On the other hand, interestingly, we find that the crowns acting as King's Court was established, no more referred as in East India Company's Court. Later, Supreme Courts were established both in Madras and Bombay. In this period, you also we also find that the judicial system had two distinct systems of courts. And those two different systems of courts were 
the English system of royal courts which followed the English law and procedures in the presidency, presidencies and the Indian system of Adalat or Sadr courts which followed the regulations laws and personal laws in the provinces. Now you have to keep in mind the following two things here in terms of understanding the evolution of judicial system in India. One that judicial system in India had following two distinct systems working simultaneously or parallelly in India. At the top there was this English system of royal courts. Now these English system of royal courts were largely driven by the English laws and the procedures in these courts were largely to take care of the presidencies and the Indian system. On the other hand, then you have the second system which was also functioning parallelly in the Indian judiciary system and that was of Indian system of Adalat or what we call as Sadr courts. These Sadr courts, they were following the regulations laws of local nature and they were mainly dealing with the cases which had to do with the personal laws in the provinces. Later on under the High Court of High Court Act of 1861 that these two systems were merged. Now here it is important to note that these two systems that is the English system of royal courts and the Adalat or Sadr courts they were merged together through the High Court Act of 1861 and they replaced the Supreme Courts and the native courts that is the Sadr Diwani Adalats and Sadr Nijamat Adalats in the presidency towns of Calcutta, Bombay and Madras with high courts. Thus one can see and say that it is only through this coming of the act of 1861 that is the high court act of 1861 that the dual system of courts in India were replaced. In fact those, du those two dual system of royal courts and of Sadr courts were merged together to form what we now call as the high courts. If you look into the constituent assembly debate, we find that in interesting developments which ultimately gave birth to the idea of judiciary as we know it today. The members of the constituent assembly envisaged the judiciary as the bastion of rights and justice. They wanted to insulate the courts from attempted cohesion from forces within and outside the government. Now here we have to keep at the back of our mind this fact that all those who were participated in the India's freedom struggle and India's independence movement, they had a very long experience of carefully watching and suffering and facing the problem of this co-terminity of both the executive legislation and judiciary. The political leaders and the intellectuals of India during the India's freedom struggle had seen that how over a period of time the British Empire has coerced and exploited the Indians by ensuring that the justice system or judiciary is completely controlled by the executive and the legislative body in India. It was the lesson they learned during the colonial struggle that pushed them to decide that we will make sure that the judiciary is the best end of the rights and justice they wanted to insulate the courts from attentive cohesion from forces within and outside the government. It was because of this kind of understanding that the rights and justice are, are of paramount importance that the Sapru Committee report on Judiciary and the Constituent Assembly's ad hoc committee on the Supreme Court report formed the bulk of guidelines for Judiciary in India. Now these two committees are very important in terms of understanding that how the Constituent Assembly decided to go for this kind of a structure or format of Judiciary in India and those two were one the Sapru Committee report on Judiciary and other was the ad hoc committee on the Supreme Court. A.K. Ayer, K. Santhanaman, M. A. Yangar, Tej Pratap, Sapnur, B. N. Rao, K. M. Munshi, Sadullah and B. Ambedkar played very significant role in shaping the judicial system in India. They sat for long hours during the constituent assembly debate 
and they came out with the final proposal that Indian judiciary in India should be the integrated whole. And they have, they had their own logic and reason as to go for this kind of judiciary in India. Ambedkar was perhaps the greatest apostle of the assembly of what he described as one single integrated judiciary having jurisdictions and providing remedies in all cases arising under the constitutional law, the civil or the criminal essential to maintain the unity of the country. Now, if you look into the carefully look into this uh, argument and the statement of Ambedkar, it will be clear that why the political participants, the political leaders of that time decided to go for an integrative form of judiciary in India. He had this argument that one single integrated judiciary having jurisdictions and providing remedies in all cases arising under the constitutional law, the civil and the criminal law is essential to maintain the unity of country and thus it is clearly there that they chose this unity of India as the of topmost importance when it comes to thinking that why the judiciary in India should have an integrated format. If we look into the structure of judiciary in India, we find that under our constitution there is a single integrated system of courts for the union as well as the states, which administer both union and state laws. At the head of the system stands the Supreme Court of India. I have already discussed this, so I will not go into the detail of it at the moment with just one line on this that if you have to understand judiciary in India, you have to keep at the back of your mind the fact that judiciary in India is an integrated whole with Supreme Court and High Courts completely linked and they both administer both the union and state laws and the Supreme Court is playing the role of the head in this process. Below the Supreme Courts are the High Courts of different states. Under each High Court, there are subordinate courts that is courts subordinate to and under the control of High Courts. Now, if you have to draw the chart of this whole structure of judiciary in India, you can do it like this. Right at the top, you have Supreme Court. Below it, you have high courts of different states. Then below those high courts, you have these subordinate courts or the district courts. And these subordinate courts are controlled by the high courts. But that is not necessarily the case in terms of the relationship between Supreme Courts and High Courts. Supreme Courts and High Courts, as I have already mentioned, they derive their power and legitimacy and functioning through the Constitution of India. But the subordinate courts are completely controlled by administrative wise through the High Courts. It is important again to understand here that the it has the Supreme Court is the highest court of law in India. Sorry, we were discussing the previous slide where I talked about this whole structure or format of the Supreme Court and the High Courts and under which then you have the subordinate courts. Moving to the next, we find that if you look into the working of the Supreme Court in India, uh, it is clear that Supreme Court is the highest court of law in India. It has the appellate jurisdictions over the high courts and is the highest tribunal of the land. Thus, if someone gets the remedy in any form from the high courts and is not satisfied, then one can move to the Supreme Court in terms of appealing against the judgment passed by the high courts. The law declared by the Supreme Court is binding on all small courts within the territory of India it has the final authority to interpret the constitution. Now, it is again very important to underline and understand here that the law declared by the Supreme Court is binding on all small courts within the territory of India and 
it is also important to note down here that whatever that law is declared by the supreme court it is the final authority to interpret the constitutions and there should not be any confusion over it that it is the supreme court which is the guardian of constitution in india because it only has the power to interpret the provisions made in the constitution thus independence and integrity the powers and functions and judicial reviews are the issues of utmost importance concerned with the supreme court here now it is become important to note that it becomes very important that when it comes to the structure of the supreme court that its independence the integrity of the supreme court its powers and its functions along with its power to judicial review are the issues of utmost importance concerned with the topmost court and it is for this reason that all the provisions related to them are provided in the constitution of india so that its neutrality can be ensured the supreme court of india has become has come to assume the mantle of the supreme court for indians and now this statement by upendra bakshi is of utmost importance he is trying to argue that the supreme court of india is not only an institution which is part of judiciary right at the top and thus has the ultimate power in terms of controlling the lower courts or in terms of ensuring the role of uh, appellate jurisdiction he is trying to suggest that over a period of time more so after this era of uh, public interest litigations which it started in 1970s and 80s that gradually in last 7 decades or so the supreme court of india has assumed the mantle of supreme court for indians and it is a kind of a commentary on the working of the constitutional framework of india and its democracy where for certain period of time whenever the democracy was in, under un, under any kind of negative influence or whenever it was a situation where either the legislative legislative bodies or judiciaries were not working as per the expectations of the people or as per the law of the land or as per the demand of the democratic institutions of that time that supreme court intervened and eventually the supreme court acquired that legitimacy of working not only as a guardian of the constitution but also as an institution which is the last hope for millions of people in india and that's how it became the supreme court not only of india but for indians too in the past few decades the court has opened its door to public spirited citizens expanded the frontiers of fundamental rights and even rewritten parts of the constitution similarly if you look into this comment made by bhagwati pn bhagwati he stated that in the last few decades and he is writing it in 1985 so he is precisely referring to the role of judiciary in 1960s and 70s to argue that eventually the court in india have opened their door to the public spirited citizens and even those who are not necessarily directly involved in any case or any issue but simply because of ensuring the interest of the public that they have approached the court then the court has heard them and has given justice to all and it is through this process of public interest litigations that court in, in india have expanded the frontiers of fundamental rights they have protected the fundamental rights of people they have also even ensure that the court is at times courts have rewritten the part of the constitution to ensure that it is not going to throttle or it's not going to choke the democratic ethos of this country similarly pillai argues that the court has over time transformed itself into an arena in which political social and economic battles are fought and socio economic justice is delivered now this is an interesting 
take on the role of judiciary in India, where Pillai argues that the court has itself transformed into an arena in which political, social and economic battles are fought and socio-economic justice is delivered. Now we have to keep in mind that despite the fact that it is assumed that the judiciary is supposed to maintain its neutrality on the one hand and on the other hand it is also supposed to follow the principle of uh, separation of power. But we have also seen that because of the challenges, the kind of political, economic and social challenges India has faced in last so many centuries that they suffered in the realm of social discrimination, they suffered in the realm of economic discriminations and as and when the situation has arrived where the fundamental rights of the citizens were challenged or they thought that they have been discriminated that the court has intervened and at times that court has become the arena of contestations both for political as well as socio-economic battles. This expensive judicial role in modern India has been welcomed in some quarters as chemotherapy for the carcinogenic body politic. Upendra Bhakshi again in his another writing in 2003 argues that if you look into the timely interventions of the Supreme Court or the judiciary in India in the working of the Indian democracy, then he draws the parallelity between the medical intervention in the form of chemotherapy provided to the carcinogenic body politic to this whole intervention of Supreme Court into the problems which the political and economic structures of India have suffered over a period of time. In other words, Open Vaxi is trying to underline the undesirable but necessary intervention of Supreme Court which was the demand of the time which led to its interventions time and again. In order to understand the composition and the appointment format of the Supreme Court of India, we have to go back to the constitution in order to understand that how this institution has certain provisions and which make sure that its neutrality is maintained. If you look into the details, we find that the Supreme Court consists of Chief Justice of India and not more than 25 other judges. In other words, there can be at max total 26 judges in the Supreme Court, 25 other judges and the Chief Justice of India. In addition, there can be ad hoc judges for a temporary period due to lack of quorum of the permanent judges. However, parliament has the power to make laws regulating the constitution, organization, jurisdictions and powers of the Supreme Court. Now this is very important. Again as I have already discussed this provision of check and balance. So here you find that if on the one hand there are certain provisions which are ensured in the constitution to maintain the independence, autonomy and the neutrality of the Supreme Court. On the other hand, it is being also checked and balanced by the this provision that laws regulating the constitution, constitution, organizations, jurisdictions and powers of the Supreme Court can be made by the parliamentary laws or the legislative laws. The constitution makes it clear that President shall appoint the Chief Justice of India and after consultation with the such judges of the Supreme Court and of High Courts as he may deem necessary. Now this is again very important aspect of it that constitution makes it clear that President shall appoint the Chief Justice of India after consultation with such judges of the Supreme Court and of High Courts as he may deem necessary. And this has remained the problem for very long as to independence of judiciary in terms of the appointment of the judges that judges are being appointed by the judges themselves through their own uh, in-house arrangements but in terms of their appointment it is finally the president who appoints the judges. Now this tension has its own history 
at the moment we will not go into the detail of it and we find that in case of appointment of the other judges of the supreme court the consultation with the chief justice in addition to judges is obligatory now here is the catch that while the supreme court chief justice is appointed by the president on the basis of the seniority or at times that seniority is overridden but the other judges the rest of the 25 judges they are appointed by the supreme court in consultation with the chief justice and it is obligatory for the government to appoint a person shall not be now here coming to the qualification part of it we find that following are some of the very important qualifications uh, in terms of appointment of judges and the following conditions are laid a person shall not be qualified for appointment as a judge of the supreme court unless she or he is a citizen of india either a distinguished jurist or has been a high court judge for at least 5 years or has been an advocate of a high court for at least 10 years now either one of the three are to be qualified in order to become a judge other than the fact that he or she should be a citizen of india and those three are one that either he or she is a distinguished jurist or he or she has been a high court judge for at least 5 years or he or she has been an advocate of high court for at least 10 years another important aspect is that once appointed a judge holds office until he attains 65 years of age thus 65 years is decided as the age of retirement for the judges in supreme court and in the high courts he or she may resign his office by writing address to the president or he may be removed by the president upon an address to that effect being passed by special majority of each house of the parliament on grounds of proved misbehavior and incapacity thus this provision of proved misbehavior or incapacity are the two bases on the ground of which a judge can be removed by a special majority of the parliament and here you find the classic example of check and balance where through the special majority it is been ensured that yes a judge can be removed by the legislature or by the parliament but only in certain circumstances or certain grounds that is proved misbehavior so until that behavior is proved he cannot be or she cannot be removed and also that incapacity is being proved even after the proof of that incapacity or misbehavior a special majority is needed to remove the judge and that ensures the impartiality in the process of removal of judge the salaries and allowances of the judges are fixed high in order to secure their independence efficiency and impartiality now these three aspects become very important when it comes to working of the judiciary and judicial system in india that their independence efficiency and impartiality is ensured by making provisions of their salaries within the constitutional framework and they are fixed in terms of those provisions the constitution also provides that the salaries of the judges cannot be changed to their disadvantage except in times of financial emergency now as i have mentioned again this provision is very important in terms of understanding that how the impartiality of the judge is ensured by making sure that the salary cannot be changed to their disadvantage except in times of financial emergency and this is again it is provided in order to ensure that they are impartial and not necessarily compromised or come under the pressure of any government or any other forces the administrative expenses of the supreme court the salaries allowances etc of the judges are charged on the consolidated fund of india so as in case of the president 
Similarly, in case of judiciary also in India, their salaries and their allowances and all other administrative expenses of the Supreme Court judges and of high courts, they are charged on the consolidated fund of India and thus it is ensured that it is not decided and dictated by any government of its time. If we look into the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, we find that it has different interesting component or aspects of it. The Supreme Court has vast jurisdictions and its position is strengthened by the fact that it acts as a court of appeal, as a guardian of the constitution and as a reviewer of its own judgments. Now here you can see that there are three different domains within which the courts are supposed to have jurisdictions and more so of the Supreme Court. The first is what we call as the court of appeal. The second is what we call as the court as the guardian of the constitution. So it has the role of the interpreter and three as the reviewer of its own judgments. So the lower bench judgment is being reviewed by the judge of a higher number of judges. If we look into the article 141, it declares that the law laid down by the Supreme Court shall be binding on all courts within the territory of India. Its jurisdiction is divided into four categories. Now, this article 141 is very important in terms of understanding the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. On the one hand, it ensures that jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, whatever the laws are being passed or laid down by the Supreme Court, they must be binding on all the courts within the territory of India and its jurisdiction is then divided into four parts or the four categories. The first category is what we call as original jurisdiction and writ jurisdiction. Article 131 gives the Supreme Court exclusive original jurisdiction in a dispute between the union and the state or between one state and another or between group of states and other. Now this is important to understand at the outset that when it comes to the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, they are applicable in cases of disputes between union or states or between two states or between group of states on one side and other state on the other hand that when Supreme Court intervenes and laid down any law, then that law is coming out of its original jurisdiction. It acts therefore as a federal court that is the parties to the dispute should be units of federation. Now here we can see that the Supreme Court acts as the federal court of India. No other court in India has the power to entertain such disputes. Now it should be very clear at the outset that in case of tensions between two different states or between union and any states, it is only the Supreme Court which has the right to intervene. Supreme Court is the guardian of fundamental rights and thus has non-exclusive original jurisdiction as the protector of fundamental rights. The Supreme Court has the power to issue writs such as habeas corpus, co warranto, prohibition, certiori and mandamus and these five kinds of writs which the Supreme Court has the power to issue it is in case it finds that the fundamental right has been compromised. In addition to issuing these writs, the Supreme Court is empowered to issue appropriate directions and orders to the executive. Now it is important to understand in this context that the Supreme Court has not only the power to issue these rights but is also has the power to issue appropriate directions and orders to the executive to execute its writ. In addition to the original jurisdictions and the writ jurisdictions, the Supreme Court also has the power of advisory jurisdictions. Article 143 of the constitution vests the president the power to seek advice regarding the question of law or fact of public importance or 
cases belonging to the disputes arising out of pre constitution treaties and agreements which are excluded from its original jurisdictions now this is very important that other than the writ jurisdictions or the original jurisdictions the supreme court also has the power to give advice when asked by the president on those issues which are not necessarily falling within the domains of original jurisdictions so for instance on those issues like any treaties with the government of has gone into before the coming of the indian constitution and there is any doubt or confusion regarding it then the president can invite the opinion of the supreme court similarly this jurisdiction that is advisory jurisdiction does not involve a less that is the advisory opinion is not binding on the government and thus it is not executable it is only advisory in nature and thus government has the power to either accept or refute it the third important jurisdiction of the supreme court is in the form of appellate and that is the supreme court is the highest court of appeal from all courts its appellate jurisdictions may be divided into following one cases involving interpretation of the constitution civil criminal or otherwise so if you look into this whole uh, appellate jurisdiction power of the supreme court we find that it has following divisions one is on those cases the supreme court has the power in terms of executing uh, on the appellate jurisdictions that is the cases involving interpretation of the constitutions and interpretation of the constitutions regarding the cases which has something to do with the civil criminal or otherwise similarly in civil cases it has the appellate jurisdictions irrespective of any constitutional questions not necessarily that all those civil cases or the criminal cases as in the third category where the co constitutional questions are involved even in case of non involvement of constitutional issues the supreme court has the power of appellate jurisdictions and thus any party which is not satisfied with the decisions of the high court can move to supreme court for the remedy article 132 provides for an appeal to the supreme court by the high court certifications the supreme court may grant special leave to the appeal article 133 provides for an appeal in civil cases and article 134 provides the supreme court with appellate jurisdictions in criminal matters in addition we have the provision of review jurisdiction in case of supreme court where the supreme court has the power to review any judgment pronounced or order made by itself under article 137 the as it the provision is for review of judgment or orders by the supreme court wherein subject to the provisions of any law made by the parliament or any rules made under article 145 the supreme court shall have the power to review any judgment pronounced or made by it if we look into the working of the indian judiciary and we try to figure out the assessment of the judiciary in last so many decades it will be interesting to figure out that how over a period of time judiciary in india has evolved and matured if you look into the evolution of the court from a modest institutions seeking to find its place in newly independent india in 1947 to a powerful dynamic actor that shapes law that evolves policy and plays a central determinative role in the governance of modern india then you can easily see and conclude that the, there is a clear cut shift in the way the judiciary is being perceived in the indian political system as it is very clear in the very opening line of this uh, slide that you find that the evolution of courts from their initial is to the current time there is a clear cut dynamic evolve evolution 
of the Supreme Court and it has shaped the law, the policies and the governance in modern India. Over the years, through progressive and far-reaching decisions, the court has demonstrated a commitment to preserving constitutional liberty. And here again you find that after 1960s onwards, as the crisis in the socio-political and economic domain started emerging, that Supreme Court always played the role of a progressive intervention and through its progressive intervention that it ensured that it has far reaching decisions which shaped the future of India in many ways and through which it also preserved the constitutional liberty of the country. It has also demonstrated an ability to keep the executive in check and to adapt and respond to the demands placed on it as a consequence of inaction or ineffectiveness of other wings of government. Here again the role of the Supreme Court is very important that it has played the crucial role of not only checking the executive but also ensuring that as and when the executive or the legislature is ineffective or they are going slow that they are being pushed by the judiciary in India and by the Supreme Court more so, so that they are active and they are playing the role of the protector as well as the executor of the people's need and demand. In the last few decades, as some of the commentators of those who are studying Supreme Court and judiciary in India have argued that there are signs of overreach by the court and however they are the early signs and dangers of such overreach in particular the concerns that arise with the policy evolution role in court is regularly called upon to play that in last few decades we see that at times it appears that supreme court or the judici judiciary in india is overreaching its own limits and it is because of this overreach of its limit that there are tensions between the executive legislature and on the one side and judiciary on the other side. But what is the strength of the democracy in India is that it has always underlined this overreach of Supreme Court or judiciary in India. It could be argued that court is ill-equipped to play this role and, it's, and in seeking to do so, it compromises on the role that it is equipped and required to play. With this, we are ending this lecture and here are some of the referenced and suggested readings for you for a more deeper consultation and deeper understanding of the role of Supreme Court and ju judiciary in the Indian context. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw 
absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.